Welcome to Green Dot Daily. I'm Maria Marino. We're live every weekday at 3 Eastern on the Action app. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. We're going to start off today's show with some betting news in college basketball. Thursday's UAB and Temple men's basketball game was flagged for unusual betting activity, according to a report by Sports Handle's Bennett Conlon. UAB opened as two and a half point favorites, but closed favored by seven and a half. And this amount of line movement on a game this late into the season without injuries or suspensions was a red flag to many on social media. U.S. Integrity CEO Matt Holt told Sports Handle the game, quote, might be looked into deeper. UAB went on to defeat Temple 172. That was the worst loss of the season for Temple. And in response, Temple Men's Basketball Director of Strategic Communications, Chad Cooper, said, quote, we are aware of the social media posts regarding last night's men's basketball game. We will review the reports thoroughly in accordance with university and NCAA policies. While we can't comment any further at this time, we take this matter very seriously. Temple's next game is Sunday against UTSA. Well, we have so much to do on the rest of the show. By the way, you may have noticed some purple accents. We are celebrating International Women's Day, but we got NASCAR, women's college hoops, Premier League, and more on the way. First, though, Carolina got in on the fun before the NHL trade deadline, making deals with Pittsburgh and Washington for Jake Gensel and Evgeny Kuznetsov. The Penguins received a haul in return for Gensel, including forward Michael Bunting, prospects, and conditional first and fifth round picks in the 2024 draft. Our hockey expert, Tim Kalinowski, joins us now to react to this. How impactful do you think these trades can be for the Hurricanes? I think they're really impactful. Um, you know, Carolina's been a team for a number of years now that has been certainly capable of winning a Stanley Cup. They've had that Stanley Cup makeup under coach Rob Brendan Moore, but they've lacked that easy goal scoring, right? They always say in the NHL, if you can score goals, you'll get paid. And if you have a goal scorer, that's why you have to pay them. That's how you get the big bucks. And uh, Gensel certainly one of those guys. He's someone that can provide you with that easy scoring when it becomes more difficult in the playoffs. So, um, you know, a lot of people liked Carolina before this trade just because, again, their makeup, they're really hard to play against. It's perfect playoff style hockey. But, um, you know, Gensel really takes them to another level. And not just for, for the, the Stanley Cup necessarily, but – in the division, in this playoff race, it's still very much on in terms of jockeying for position and seeding. So I'll give you here, and this is, I liked this. Well, you know, Nick Martin tipped me off to it. He's a lot smarter than me. I'm learning from him. Um, he he liked Carolina to win the Metro division a, a week or two ago. Um, they're now sitting at plus 165 to win the Metro at FanDuel. The team ahead of him is the New York Rangers. And I like Carolina here. I, again, Nick liked them before the trade. And if you think about it with the trade, uh, the Rangers were in on Gensel very much so so Carolina getting Gensel basically means that you know it's like a it's a bigger swing because now New York essentially loses out on Gensel new uh and Carolina adds a Jake Gensel so net net I see this as closer to a coin flip um give me Carolina to win the division now in a very dangerous Stanley Cup team mm. well now that we see what fully sort of went down before this deadline who are your winners and losers? And you mentioned there the Rangers that maybe they could have done more. Yeah, and I'll just preface it by saying I, I think we tend to overrate a lot of these things. And I know that's no fun, but uh, you kind of kind of put the kibosh on these things. Like <laughs> th there's teams that have made a number of deals and, and taken big swings and, and, you know, in trade deadline history, but it's not like the NBA where like, you know, this one player can come in and play the entire game and totally alter, you know, a team's direction and chances to win these in terms of, if you look at the odds board, this only really changes a team's 
chances to win by a couple percentage points, if that, you know, we're talking half a percentage point here and there when we were looking at implied probability. So I kind of say, you know, cool it a little bit, but in terms of winners, I look at Dallas, Carolina, and Vegas. And, and Dallas made a big move a week ago in, in trading for Tanev from Calgary. They also called up Logan Stankoven from their AHL team, and he's been dynamite already, so they didn't even have to trade any assets. They just called him up, and that's basically like getting a trade deadline acquisition. I think if they had gotten Tanev and called up Stan Coven today, we might have been saying that Dallas outright won the trade deadline, but I also have Caroline in the mix there for the Gensel reason that I mentioned prior. Throw in Vegas as well. They've had Mark Stone on LTIR and they've been able to use the cap space there to add the likes of Hannafin, Mantha. It's just, it seems that every year Vegas does this, but um, you know, I, I would I would argue that it's not necessarily a loophole. It's just that Vegas is aggressive in taking advantage of their LTIR. And if you have winners, you have to have losers. So I'll mention the Rangers in this conversation, the LA Kings and the Vancouver Canucks. And I think what this has to do when you're talking about Rangers and the Canucks is that they missed out on Gensel. And then they also missed out on what I would call the second place for Gensel, which is Tyler Toffoli, who went to the Winnipeg Jets. So those two teams losing out on Gensel has them as L's to me, throwing the mm. LA Kings for not being able to address their goaltender situation. I know I went on Maria, but it's been a busy two weeks in the NHL. I had to just dump it out. <laughs> no, it was perfect. Um, you were engaging as ever, Tim. But so just to clarify, you're saying like your power rankings haven't changed all that much based on what happened this week. I think a lot of us, you know, make power rankings, especially around deadline time. I kind of penciled teams in already, you know, moving them up before they had made a move just because it was obvious that they should make a move. Right. It was like more so the, a play on their potential to make a move. So I, I just look at a team like Colorado. They brought in a ton um, you know, Casey Middlestad is probably the headliner. He'll be the second line center there. And my, my, um, my power ranking in Colorado, I think a lot of people would be shocked to find out it doesn't change too much because quite honestly, Colorado, I think their biggest problem is still in net, or at least it makes me a little um, anxious because, mm -hmm. you know, Gorgiev is, he's okay, um, you know, compared to a team like that has Ottinger or Hollerbuck, the two other uh, combatants in the division there. So um, you just kind of can't overreact, Maria. You just can't overreact. Yeah. But I will say, there has been a gap now when you look at the odds board. The teams that didn't make moves, they have stayed stagnant or plummeted in terms of their futures. While uh, So I guess there's a clear like black and white who's a contender, who's not now when you look at the odds board. And I, I kind of had that penciled in. There you go. Well, we appreciate you breaking it all down for us, Tim Kalinowski. Thanks. Enjoy your weekend. I will, Maria. I'm going to try my best. Hockey, hockey, hockey. And the best is Nick Martin following up with uh, with motorsports. That, that is what I call a weekend, Maria. <laughs> Indeed. Speaking of, don't miss our podcast, Running Hot, wherever you get your pods, with episodes out every Thursday. Now that NASCAR season is well underway, so so much to watch this weekend. And you can hear our predictive analyst, Nick Giffen, on that very podcast. And he joins us now. Welcome back to the show. Uh, let's start with NASCAR. What is the pick you want to give out for this weekend? Yeah, so we got a, a great motorsports weekend. We have NASCAR at Phoenix. We have IndyCar at St. Petersburg for their season opener. But for my NASCAR pick, uh, last pick of the week, obviously I gave out some on running hot. Uh, but I am going with Ross Chastain. To finish as the top Chevy driver at plus 375 at Bet MGM. Ross is great at Phoenix. Uh, he won the most recent trips to trip to Phoenix, which was the last race of the year last year, the championship race. He even beat championship winner Ryan Blaney, who finished second. So Ross ended up winning that race. The first time a non-championship driver has won the championship race. Uh, he also had either the best or the second best car in the championship race two years ago, and he actually was one of the championship drivers that year. He finished third behind Joey Logano and Ryan Blaney, but he was actually catching them at the end. Ryan Blaney was kind of playing wingman for Joey Logano there since they're teammates and was able to hold off Ross, but Ross legitimately could have won the championship uh, if there wasn't that little teamwork gamesmanship there going on against him. And then in the first 2022 race at Phoenix, he finished second place. So three of the four Phoenix races in the next-gen era Ross has had one of the best cars and he's finished inside the top three and all three of those he finished as the top Chevy driver. Uh, by also taking him as top Chevy, I get to avoid 
you know, the the Toyotas and the Fords, because there's some questions around them. May may they improve a whole lot on the offseason? Because each of the Toyota and Ford camps, their cars have a new body where they have made some improvements to try to get better at these track types. Especially Toyota looked great in the preseason test at Phoenix, where we'll be this weekend. So uh, by doing a top Chevy play, I'm just comparing Ross against other Chevys and hoping he's the best Chevy. And if we look at Chevy, the best traditionally Chevy team has been Hendrick Motorsports. Well, they took a step back in the second half last year on these shorter, flatter tracks like Phoenix. Uh, and to me, it appeared Kyle Larson struggled a little bit in that preseason test at Phoenix that we were talking about. So if those are the cases, then that even helps Ross just in the Chevy market here. So, you know, he's easily been the best Chevy in aggregate over the four Phoenix races. You add in HMS potentially slipping a little bit at this track type. I make him the favorite among the Chevys and I'd bet him accordingly. Fantastic. And we're not going to stop there because we have IndyCar as well, which you teased last week when you were on. Yeah, IndyCar, my favorite series, even more than NASCAR. They're actually on track right now, so odds did just come off the board. Uh, but if they come back up, I certainly would be looking at Scott McLaughlin to win at 7-1. to one. Uh, He won this race at St. Petersburg two years ago. Last year, he was possibly going to win. It was either going to be him or Roman Grosjean, and they crashed while battling for the lead right after the final pit stop. So two years in a row, he literally could have won this race. Last year at the five street circuits, he led the most laps, 91 laps of all of the drivers on the five street circuits. So I, I think he arguably should be the race favorite. So like I said, uh, in the same way that I would bet Ross accordingly as top Chevy, if odds come back on the board after practice and his practice times look good, I'd accordingly bet him towards the race favorites. Very nice. Well, we appreciate the heads up. Now, before we let you go, we're going to have to get a college basketball pick from you because yesterday you went 7-0 and in player props. Our pal Sean Kerner also went 3-0, and so yeah. great day yesterday. We want to keep it going today. What do you got? Yeah, we're going to go to the A-10 in the Giffen family rivalry game, Dayton versus VCU. Yeah, two of my brothers went to the University of Dayton. One of my wow. brothers went to VCU. So this is uh, the family rivalry game. I'm just the neutral observer that wants to win money off this game. <laughs> but uh, so will for they, me- Will they be like watching intently tonight, your brothers? Oh yeah, I'm sure they will be. Um, especially, you know, especially the Dayton side because they're they're going to the tournament. VCU is going to have to make their way through the A10 tournament to to yes, qualify yes, for yes. the NCAA. But Fair uh, so I'm going to go with Sean Bearstow uh, for VCU over three and a half assists at minus 145. Uh, and if we look at this, Max Shulga is questionable for VCU and, and Javon Bennett is questionable for Dayton, but specifically for Shulga on the VCU side, uh, it sounds like. Based off the coach speak, what I heard is they kind of want Shulga ready for the conference tournament because even winning here versus Dayton isn't going to get them in the field of 68. So their focus is on the conference tournament. So my gut tells me Shulga is not going to play. And in the two most recent games where Shulga either missed half the game or fully missed the game, uh, Baristow averaged 38 and a half minutes. And when he plays at least 30 minutes, he averages nearly five assists per game. So three and a half is pretty low number here. And Dayton is a great matchup for assists. They allow a little bit higher assist rate than the national average. Uh, and more importantly, Dayton has the fourth lowest foul rate in the nation. And they're only 283rd in turnover rate forced. So all of these possessions, most of these possessions, I should say, are going to be ending in shot attempts for VCU. And of course, shot attempts means potential assist opportunities. And I will say he did only have three assists versus UD last time. However, uh, that was in 34 minutes. I'm projecting 37 or more, especially with Shulga out. And VCU and Dayton, for that matter, both struggled to score. The game finished 49 to 47. Should be a higher scoring game. Um, you know, these teams definitely, the defense has played great. The offense has played terrible last time. But VCU's projected uh, implied team total is 14 and a half points more than the 49 last game. And so if they actually score that amount, that would amount to about another assist uh, or a little over another assist there for Bearstow. So I'm projecting 4.9 assists with around a 72% chance to clear this three and a half line. Uh, which is, you know, 13% more than that 59% implied odds at, at minus 145. And even if Shulga does play, I'm still projecting Barristow for 4.6 assists with a 66% chance to clear this prop. So uh, I like it whether Shulga is in or out, but certainly like it more if Shulga is out. 
Well, Nick, enjoy the Githen family rivalry game. Keep everybody, you know, under control. Hopefully you'll win some money and uh, no one will be upset. Uh, by the way, we're going to talk about the other matchup tonight featuring a ranked team on the men's slate in a few minutes. So stick around for that. But Nick, thanks again. Yeah. And uh, shout outs to mom on International Women's Day for, uh, you know, letting this family rivalry happen. <laughs> oh, shout outs to mom. Love it. If you've ever wanted to try the best version of the Action app, that time is now because we're running a special offer on Action Pro. To celebrate the start of the NCAA tournament, you can try Pro Access for just $9.99 for the first month. With Action Pro, you get our biggest betting model edges, real-time money percentages, data-driven systems, NCAA tournament player prop projections from the predictive analytics team of Sean Kerner and Nick Giffen, and lots more. Just visit actionnetwork.com slash madness to take advantage before this deal expires. That's actionnetwork.com slash madness. Let's welcome in our women's college basketball analyst, Dano Mattia, joining us from the Pac-12 tournament in Vegas, you're in your hotel room. The vibes seem immaculate. 70s yeah. going on. How you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling great. Uh, <laughs> been an awesome run here. I mean, super cool to be at the last Pac-12 tournament ever. Uh, and even better that, you know, we did a lot of research on this tournament in the past few years and noticed that unders have been killing at an insane rate. But uh, they're 7-1 and one through eight games, and we only got three left. So wow. love that. The only one that went over was uh it, it went over in double overtime um which was an insane game if anyone missed it oregon state came back down 12 in the fourth um my team of destiny we'll get to them later or yes, now i mean you you were tr treated to a, a classic and oregon state now gets stanford so let's start with how you're betting that game in particular well i'm gonna stick with the trend i'm taking the under here uh i think it, the total is at 132 and a half both these matchups went under uh, under the total in their their first two matchups, and we didn't see Reagan Beers in the second matchup, and we didn't see Cameron Brink in the first matchup. Uh, the first matchup was the one that Tara got her like all time winning as coach. Uh, so there's no way you know Oregon State was winning that game um, <laughs> at Maples, but uh, Oregon State their defense has just been phenomenal. And having Reagan Beers guard Cameron Brink, I think, is huge. Um, Tamia Gardner is going to be guarding Kiki Rice, who I think had a double-double in the second half alone yesterday. I think 18 and 15, just unreal. But uh, sticking with the under, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on both these teams. Uh, the energy just gives under. I mean, everyone is diving for balls. Uh, it's 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 amazing. I love the vibe of this tournament. Um, and I'm, I'm going to keep riding that under wave. Indeed. And, and kind of sad for sure that it's the last one of its kind, but Hey, you call them the team of destiny. How much do you love Oregon state in this tournament? Oh, uh, <laughs> for one, like being, I mean, I've seen every team play so far. No crowd has been as electric as Oregon states. They've traveled better than anybody. Uh, it's there's a sea of orange um it's <laughs> a distinct orange i mean you can cut it out from anybody <laughs> so uh and stanford's crowd was really not that great against cal i mean maybe they'll get more since it's a friday in vegas but i assume we're gonna get more oregon state fans as well so uh i do i do like oregon state tonight um i mean they're eight and a half point uh underdogs and so i mean i'm i'm gonna be betting that as well but i like oregon state to win the entire tournament uh, this team is just so composed, so poised. They have weapons all over the place. Uh, we've seen they can do it without Reagan Beers. I mean, they beat UCLA on that amazing game uh, where Talia Van Olhoffen hit a game winner. Uh, they haven't beaten USC yet, but I do like their chances against them as well with the healthy Reagan Beers. Uh, Reagan Beers changes everything. And like, my favorite shirt I saw this this week was uh, – beeves buckets beers and it's <laughs> it's on point if you haven't seen her play give it a watch she's a stud you know stud sophomore huge down low and i love the value that we're getting at eight and a half to one they've covered both games against stanford um and they're due for a win uh yeah stanford, like you said before we were talking they do look kind of fraudulent at times and um i know tar probably wants to win the last pac-12 tournament but 
they do have a lot of holes and Oregon State, like I said, team of destiny vibes. So I'm taking it eight and a half to one. Bold, bold pick, just like your uh, curtains there behind you. All right, <laughs> let's switch gears now to the Big Ten. So Penn State gets Iowa at 630 Eastern. Iowa's got the top scoring offense in the country, which we already knew. But Penn State is ranked seventh. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is the highest total that you can remember. This is the highest total of the entire season. Uh, Mind-blowing. I think it's the highest total I've ever seen in women's college basketball. Uh, the previous one was this same matchup uh, back in Iowa City that was set at 176.5. And, and I think they combined for 211 points. Hannah Stolke became the number one uh, scoring player had the highest scoring game ever for a week yes. until Caitlin broke it. Hannah Stolke, who I don't think will ever score 30 points in a game again, unless it's ex it's against Penn State, who really cannot guard the post, can't guard teams in transition. But uh, the thing, I mean, I would be worried about betting this over had Penn State still been in kind of a rut, but Penn State has really done well lately. I mean, they're shooting the ball at a great clip. And I think it's a nice advantage to have already played on the court they're at in Minnesota. Uh, we're seeing that with a lot of teams like Cal yesterday was up on Stanford uh, in the first half because they had a game before. So they're used to the gym. And I'm not worried about Iowa getting used to any gym. Uh, we've seen what Caitlin can do anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. We know they're going to get out and transition. So uh, I know it's a high number, but it's high for a reason. And uh, and I know unders are killing. I think they're hitting at a 68 percent rate or 66 percent rate in the in the conference tournament game so far. I want to say they're 24 and 12, but. Uh, I think I have to take this over. Um, if anything, I mean, we saw so many free throws in the last game, too, that they played. Mm -hmm. uh, and Caitlin Clark is going to get every call because we know how much <laughs> people want to see her. I mean, it's sold out. The entire tournament uh, in Minneapolis sold out, which. For the first time with. ever. Yeah. I mean, we've never seen that in any conference tournament, not even men's. Um, yeah. So that's well, awesome. I'm rooting for a shootout, and I got this great nugget from our director of research, Evan Abrams. I think you'll appreciate. He said, we haven't seen a men's total 180 plus in over five years. January 2019, Citadel versus Samford. So Caitlin Clark at the time was a high school junior, would commit to Iowa 10 months after that. So just a little fun fact for you. But sticking with the wow. Big Ten, later at 9 Eastern, Michigan against Indiana. Indiana is the better team, but their best player has been described as day to day with a knee injury. How are you betting this one? Cool. I think I have to take Michigan on on just the the play of caution here. Uh, Mackenzie Holmes, who we we talked about, we better over the other day against Iowa, which hit. We love that, but uh, I mean, she's she's a phenomenal player. She's an All American. She's uh, been Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, losing her is like Iowa losing Caitlin. Uh, just there's it changes the complete identity of the team uh, we saw you know with with her going out in the last game um, and the backup big uh, Lily Meister also went out with an injury so I mean that's your two starting centers who are going to be giving up a lot of size and Cam Williams from Michigan is a solid big who doesn't get enough credit has great inside moves very crafty and I mean Michigan is still playing for uh, their tournament lives so I love Michigan getting double digits here, especially if McKenzie Holmes can't go. If she can't go, I would not mind sprinkling some on the Michigan money line. Um, wow. I guess, I mean, McKenzie Holmes is that big of a factor. So uh, sure. taking taking the dogs at uh, plus nine and a half. Uh, love a lot of dogs today. So um, <laughs> hope that works out. I mean, love a lot of dogs up until the final, because I did tail you on that Iowa to win the Big Ten. I think that's oh. incredible value. Um, uh, to get them as an underdog basically because I don't think I don't see them losing until mm -hmm. the you know maybe the Big Ten championship but you know when we get there we can absolutely hedge if we want or just you know take right. uh, assuming it's Ohio State on the spread and maybe yeah. hit both so um, exactly I appreciate cool. you actually brought that point up to me that if it's Ohio State and Iowa in the championship game Iowa's probably going to be favored so if we like I uh, Ohio State at that point might, you know, take that into consideration, but Dan Omataya, it's been so great having you on the show today. Enjoy the rest of the PAC 12 tournament. And by the way, for more picks, make sure you follow him at DR Mataya on Twitter. Dano, appreciate you, my friend.
Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Going to be a fun march. On the men's side, Boise State visits number 21 San Diego State at 10 Eastern. 74% of bets are on the over, 135 and a half. Meanwhile, 55% of bets and 92% of the handle are on San Diego State minus seven and a half. As we bring in our friend Anthony DeBundo. So Mountain West tournament seating still on the line in this game. How are you betting it? Yeah, so uh, when these two teams get together, uh, the pos the possession projections tend to come in too high and the total just tends to be too high. And it does, hasn't worked every time, but each of the last six meetings uh, in the last three years, kind of this iteration of these two teams, there has been some turnover. But for the most part, Boise and San Diego State play low possession, grind it out in the half court, very physical games, especially at Viejas Arena tonight where San Diego State seems to always get a friendly whistle in the, in the sense that they're able to make the game more physical. I think it plays into the hands of the under 136 and a half. There's still a minus 105 uh, out there at FanDuel. And these are also two consistently elite three-point defenses. That's a big key here. Year in and year out, Dutcher and Rice, their teams have always guarded the three-point line well. And... The big thing here as well, San Diego State, never been a great first shot offense. They tend to just throw the ball up and then go hit the offensive glass. And that's how they get a lot of their second chance looks using their physicality. But they're not going to get those chances against Boise State, who year in and year out is very good on the defensive glass as well. That keeps this game very much in the half court. And the possession projection from Ken Palm, for example, is 66. The last three, uh, six meetings, there's been 61, 60, 60, 66, 59, 66 possessions. So They've almost never gone over it, and they've often come in under that number in the possession projection. So at 136 and a half, uh, I, I kind of like the uh, the under in this one uh, tonight. Going a little bit against what's popular, but that's why we have you on here as the expert. And I'm so excited to talk more hoops with you come March Madness. But let's switch gears to your other specialty, Premier League soccer. Two of the top teams, Liverpool and Manchester City. We'll square off Sunday. What do you make of this match? Well, it's a big one, right? So it's the highest leverage match remaining in the season. Right now, Liverpool sits one point ahead of Manchester City in the table, two points ahead of Arsenal. The betting odds see Man City not just as a favorite to win this game, but as a favorite to win the title. They're minus 120. Liverpool is the second favorite. Arsenal's come on strong here in the second uh, you know, half of the season where they've closed their odds from as high as plus 650 down to about three to one as they've continued to win. But really, this is a, a matchup of two teams who just don't lose very often. Liverpool has lost one home league match in three years. Since fans returned post-COVID, they've lost one match at home uh, in that time period. And when City has been healthy, which this weekend, it's as healthy as it's been all season. They're, they're kind of key five players for me. Rodri, Stones, Foden, De Bruyne, Holland, when all five of those guys have been healthy, they've not really lost all season long. And in their last 14 matches, 13 wins and one draw. So it's kind of similar to what City did last year. They struggled a little bit early in the season. They got healthy in the second half. They went on this absurd winning run where just nobody could touch them. And the market's kind of taking note of that with them being a road favorite at Anfield. I'm generally in line with the market on this game. Uh, we may see some over money come in. I'm, I'm tempted to play the under if you can get 3.25 at, at even money. Another look that my, my colleague BJ Cunningham mentioned on Wonder Goal, Jeremy Doku to get an assist up, up to four to one is a potentially interesting look. He's a key outlet for them on the left. City progresses the ball through the midfield. They pass to Doku. Doku swings in the crosses and, and is very effective there. So it's the highest leverage match of the season. Like I said, City's going to play Arsenal in about two and a half weeks. That's another huge one. And then there's mm -hmm. about 11 matches to go to decide which, which has the potential to be an all-time title race in the Prem. I'm sure you're already getting your popcorn ready for Sunday, even before noon Eastern. But as you mentioned, Man City still the odds on favorite to win the league. They're currently second on the table. Liverpool is in first place. They're at plus 225 Arsenal at plus 300. Now let's get a pick from you, an official pick for the weekend. Yeah, tomorrow morning, bright and early, 7.30 a.m. Eastern. We're going to go with Everton plus a half at even money at Manchester United. And there's a few key advantages that Everton has here. And, and the biggest one right now is Man United's health issues. Their, their striker who just won Premier League Player of the Month in February, he is out again for this match. He's missed the last two now. And United have looked pretty lifeless in attack for those two matches. They scored one late goal against Fulham 
in a 2-1 loss. They created 0.3 and just took three shots in their match against Man United, 0.3 expected goals uh, last week against City. So their attack is really struggling right now. And defensively, they've really had issues all year. Three of their four first-choice defenders will not be able uh, to play in this match either. So not a full-strength Man United. And Everton is the most efficient set-piece attack in the Premier League. United bottom five defensively at defending those dead ball situations. It's been a common problem for them all year. And Everton, as ugly as their attack can be from open play, they're very good at drawing and then getting those dead ball situations that they're able to take advantage of. Everton's also been the much better defense, especially with those injuries. United defensively this year, Bottom five in shots allowed, bottom seven in box entries. It's a bottom half defense, and they're still being priced as if they're better than Everton. I don't think this current version of United is all that much better. So I like Everton plus a half. Don't hate a little sprinkle on the money line, too, at three to one to pull off the upset. Can't think of a better way for you to start off your Saturday morning. We appreciate the tips and advice as usual. Anthony, thank you. Thanks for having me. Before we go, UFC 299 is this weekend as well. So here's a pick from our expert, Sean Zarillo, via the Action Network podcast. My best bet, going with Mikhail Oleksaychuk. Podcast favorite, definitely cashed some tickets on Mikhail in the past against Michelle Pereira. Another podcast favorite. I think this is a bad matchup for Pereira, though. He does not like getting pressure. Typically, he's the hammer, not the nail. Here, he is very much the nail especially early nobody pressures like more lord mccall he's also looked incredibly powerful uh since moving down in weight the the pressure the boxing i think it's going to be really dangerous for Pereira early he's going to get backed up against the fence he's a guy who likes space he likes to create chaos when he has that space even more so now in his career he's become a less chaotic fighter uh he does have the grappling upside here i think he could potentially potentially land a takedown and threaten some chokes, but Mikhail Oksaychuk, especially for the first round, is an absolute handful. Always like to bet his money line, always like to sprinkle that round one prop, getting about plus 500 or better on this fight, gotten as high as plus 900 in the past. Mikhail Oksaychuk on the money line, has the striking advantage, should win the early minutes, and I think at this weight class, against this opponent, he actually has a fairly neutral cardio battle as well, and should be able to maintain it over the course of 15 minutes. So just think he has more ways to win. Pereira probably has to grapple successfully if he wants to break the pressure of winning this fight. Remember, any picks we give out here on the show, you can easily reference by following Green Dot Daily in the Action app. We keep track so you don't have to. That'll do it for another week of Green Dot Daily. I'm Maria Marino. Thanks so much for hanging with me. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you again Monday at 3 Eastern on the Action Network YouTube channel and the Action app.